Uh, so today we're just going to have three considerations from these brief two chapters, and then we'll make some applications. First, we're going to talk about Ezekiel's strange and terrible ministry. Second, we will talk about the abominations of Israel that he goes over in these chapters. And thirdly, we'll talk about the executioners and the writer who go out into the city. And then we'll make some applications. So, first, Ezekiel's strange and terrible ministry. Yo, the prophets are weird. Straight up. There's no way around it. There's no sense in pretending that these weren't strange guys. They were called to very strange things. But among them... Ezekiel's out there, man. The Lord made him really go through a bunch of stuff. So he, he, the book begins with a mind-bending call to the ministry for Ezekiel. He had been taken out of the land, just like Daniel, and he was in Babylon. Uh, the city of Jerusalem was still standing, though, so God had not made the ultimate destruction yet. So God called Ezekiel while he was by the Kibar Canal, also by a river like Daniel, and he had these crazy visions of God and the cherubs and the wheels without and within, and the glory of the Lord above the firmament. And it's crazy, and that's his call to ministry. Right? And so that God put him through in that. You know? God told him, I'm sending you to a people that uh, they're knuckleheads. they got iron foreheads. They're not going to listen to you, but I'm going to make you just as hardcore as they are. So Ezekiel was called to that. But that was just the beginning. God made Ezekiel like live through and picture uh, the, the, the destruction that was coming to Jerusalem and God's wrath against it and what he was going to do. So Ezekiel had to go through this stuff. So like in chapter 4, it's Legomania because he makes Ezekiel build a little model city. It's a little brick, but it's supposed to be Jerusalem and he has to build siege works against it. You know, some of the Old Testament prophets, they worked in physical things and God, that was the way they pictured forth the truth of God. So... He had Ezekiel build the joint, you know what I'm saying? It's a little nice showcase, you know. Um, then in chapter 4 also, he made him lie down. So he had to lie down on his right side for 390 days on his left side. That's the healthy one, you know. They say it's better to lie on your left, and this kind of bears that out. Left side for 390 days to correspond with judgments. And then he had to lay on his right side for another 40 days to correspond with judgments. And if that wasn't bad enough, during that time he, he could make his little bread, but he, he was supposed to cook it on human dung. And he cried out to the Lord, please no. And the Lord let him use cow pies instead. So. But still, that's, not, that's the prophet life. It's not very nice. So Ezekiel's going through. Not very fun. And then chapter 5, he makes him shave his head, shave his beard, shave its locks of love. And he has, to, uh, this, he has to take his hair and put it in different parts to represent the remnant of Israel and all the rest in judgment. So he's going through. And then in, this, in chapter 8, you know, just when he thought everything was good, maybe grew his hair back. You know what I'm saying? The Lord wasn't going to let him off the hook, though, because he got, grabbed him by the, the head of his hair and took him up into the sky and took him to the Jerusalem and the visions of God. So he's just getting wrecked on every point. And it's, it's a very fitting because it's a rough time. These are not nice times when God's going to bring judgment against his people in Jerusalem. And Ezekiel had to picture that. And then if that wasn't enough, then in chapter 9, as he's been through it all, <laughs> he says, he cried in my ear with a loud voice. <laughs> so, yeah. You got it. Your heart goes out to Ezekiel. He's, you know, he's on the brink of madness, undoubtedly, his entire ministry, because he doesn't know what the Lord's going to make him do next. But well, it's very serious stuff. Ezekiel was animated by a sense of God's wrath and a sense of his anger. And so maybe those discomforts he went through helped him in that as he preached it. That's just a Word or two on Ezekiel's strange and terrible ministry. Now let's get to the text at hand. So, Second here, let's consider the abominations of Israel. As we read in chapter 8, so he's in his house in the land of Babylon with the elders, and the Lord appeared to him. This is a, a, a theophany. It's a Christophany. This is the same appearance of the glory of the Lord that he experienced in chapter 1 when he was called into the ministry. The appearance of God, which was in human form. 
and with his waist and below was like fire, and above his waist was like gleaming metal, and brightness all around. And this appearance of God appeared to him again. Now we take this to be a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he took him by a lock of his head and took him in the visions of God to Jerusalem. So when he goes to Jerusalem here, he's not literally flying through the sky, you know, like Mary Poppins style. He's not doing that. He, it's a vision. So he's not going to go to literal Jerusalem and see literal things. It's going to be a vision that pictures what God is going to do in Jerusalem because of what the people are doing there. So it's pictures and images and symbols of what God was going to do. And it lays forth their sin. And then we're going to learn a lot about sin from these chapters and the nature of idolatry and how it works in our hearts and in our minds and how God intends to deal with it. So the first thing that he shows them, he goes through series. He keeps telling them, you see this? I'm going to show you something worse. You see this? I'm going to show you something worse. So let's go through different phases here. The first thing he shows him is the image of jealousy. This is the first thing he mentions in verse 3. He took him to the entrance of the gateway of the inner court temple. Where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provokes to jealousy? And then in verse 5, Son of man, lift up your eyes toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes toward the north, and behold, north of the altar gate in the entrance was this image of jealousy. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? Okay, so let's think about it. It's temple. This temple was designed by God, he gave Moses instructions. It was built by King Solomon and dedicated by him, and the Shekinah glory of God filled this place because this was where God was worshipped. This was the one place on earth where the true and living God received true worship. This was his sanctuary. This is his temple. This is his dwelling place. And in this place is where they've set up their idols and their idolatries. So what's this image of jealousy? Um, what does it mean that it's an image of jealousy? Well, he says it provokes to jealousy. What does he mean by that? Well, God is a jealous God. He's jealous. Our jealousy is fickle. It's weak. We're way down here with our jealousy. And it's almost always sinful. Because we want what other people have. And we lose sight of what we have. That's what our jealousy does. God's jealousy is totally different. It is His zeal for His worship from His creation. And it means a lot to God <laughs> that we worship Him truly. He's jealous over His worship. That means that when we give our hearts to idols and we give our hearts to sin, that God is provoked by that. That He is angered by that. That He is moved to fury by that. That He opposes with all of His being against those things. It's a righteous jealousy, like, the, like, like proper romantic jealousy within a marriage. You're jealous over your spouse. That's righteous jealousy. Yeah, it should be, you know? That's proper. So that's my spouse. I'm theirs and they're mine. That's good. That's how we should think in our marriages. You know? We can be jealous over other stations in life too. But that's, I think, a more helpful picture of what it is for God. He designed us for Himself to worship Him. And when we don't, God is he's not playing about that because he's a jealous God. So This image that provokes to jealousy was an idol, a physical idol that they had set up in the temple gate. Now again, this is not literal here. He's given them pictures of what they're doing. But there was a time when this happened in 2 Kings 21.7, King Manasseh, and the carved image of Asherah, which is one of the gods of the place of Canaan, the carved image of Asherah that he had made, he set in the house of which the Lord had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house in Jerusalem, which I've chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. That provoked. You guys who were here for Daniel, we know about that. The, the, desola the desolation of abomination. Abomination of desolation when Antiochus Epiphanes made the, 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 the statue of Zeus 
erected in the temple. Not good. But here, God's own people are doing the same thing. They're doing it. So God is provoked by this. His people had dwelt in the land and, and enjoyed all the blessings that he gave them and all the blessings that came with his presence with them, all the spiritual blessings and the light that they enjoyed from the scriptures. This is the only place on earth that is happening at the time. The rest of the world's in complete darkness, y'all. I mean, yes, they have knowledge of God, but there's no saving knowledge. It's here. And in that very place, these very people turned against God and traded him and chose to worship idols instead. They had the most advantages of anyone who's ever been on the earth before, and that's what they did with it. And God did that on purpose, to show us what sin's like. That our problem is not the opportunities we have outwardly, our problem is within. So that the more opportunities God gives us, the more revelation God gives us, the more He teaches us about Himself, if our hearts are not changed, it will only lead to more wrath for us. But we need a fundamental change in our hearts. And that's you know, the new covenant promise that God does give them, that he will change their hearts because we need a heart change. So there's an image that provokes to jealousy. But then he moves forward and tells them, Yo, he saw there's a hole in the wall in the temple. He said, dig into the hole in the wall. Boom. So he goes in. And what does he find there? It's a secret room there. And on the walls of the room were pictures and images of all manner of creeping things and loathsome beasts, so the evil creatures too. Makes you think of the beasts in Daniel. And also all the idols of Israel. They had many idols. They had many gods. They had chosen the gods of the nations. They thought that was cool. They was about that. They preferred to be like all the other people and worship the idols. So there's a secret room here with all these pictures. And he saw the elders of Israel there getting their priestly duty on. They had the censers of the incense and the cloud of incense that God had designed for himself that was an act of worship unto God. It's a picture of prayer unto God. And they were burning the holy incense before the idols and before the images of creatures that God had made rather than to the true and living God. Not good. Makes one think of Romans chapter 1. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. This is what we have here. So, there was not a secret room in the physical temple in Jerusalem, but this is a picture of what was happening in the hearts of the people. Yeah, it's not very nice. Uh, let's see. He, he calls he, in, in, verse, um, in verse 12 here. Have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the dark, each in his room of pictures? Now we're going to think about that as we go here a little bit later. The nature of idolatry and the room of pictures, which is in our hearts and in our minds. By nature, our friend John Calvin said, the human heart is a factory of idols that we're capable of producing so much things to worship inside, and that's the room of pictures. Okay, but he goes on and says, that's not it. That's not, there's more. He saw women weeping for Tammuz, that's a god of fertility, god of blessing on you know, the crops and the land and the weather and the nice things. It's a... You know, it's arid, it's hot there, so in the summer everything gets scorched. But in, so they had this idea that Tammuz, apparently, I don't know this, you know what I'm saying, um, would go, would be trapped in the underworld. And so they were weeping for Tammuz that, she might, that he might return, that the, 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 that the waters might flow and the crops may grow and the blessings might come. So weeping for Tammuz, the women, God's women, who are called to worship God are instead crying, pouring out their hearts and, and the, their emotions for this false god. Not so nice. And he tells them, but I'm going to show you more. There's more. So he took them to the temple, and at the entrance of the temple, there was 25 men, and uh, they had their backs to the temple, 
That's a no-no. Remember when Solomon uh, founded the temple? He said, God, wherever you scatter your people, if they turn towards this temple and pray, please hear them. That's what the temple was. That's what Daniel did, prayed towards the temple. Well, here's God's people. They got their back to the temple. They're not really feeling it, not so interested. And their, their faces are toward the east, and they're worshiping the sun toward the east. So their idolatries had many different forms here. They're worshiping some good things that God made. God made creeping things. There's nothing evil about those in, in, his, in themselves. He made them in Eden. There's certainly nothing evil about the sun. God made the sun. The sun is good. The sun is a good. It's a blessing. You know what I'm saying? But they turned those good things that were meant to beautify God's creation and to help them know God and to give them blessing. The sun is good. It's good to see the sun. They turn those things into idols. And that's what we do. We take good things that God made and gave us freely as gifts and we turn them into gods. And that's what they were doing. But it didn't stop there. They went beyond that. And they also created gods of their own. Fashioned idols. They took the gods of the nations. They loved what sinful people had come up with. Different gods they could worship. They gravitated towards that. They were about that. And we do the same thing. Not only do we take good things and turn them into idols and forget that they're gifts from God. That's, that's the key. To remember God's good blessing through the gift. To remember the giver through the gift. But not only that, but we fashion foul things that we worship. Sinful things and behaviors and ideas that ought not to be. We also worship those. So it's double. It's both. We are capable, because of sin, of turning everything into an idol. Oh, we have to be careful. And it's something that happens in our hearts. So we'll, we'll talk more about this. But God has one more thing to say for him. In verse 17, Then he said to me, Have you seen this, son of man? Is it too light a thing that they've done all this, that they're also filling the land with violence and provoking me to anger? So, in addition to all their idolatrous worship, they also were committing injustices and violence against each other. They were oppressing the poor. He said the city is full of injustice. And the rulers of the city and the judges of the city had been corrupted. They weren't right. So it's not like they were false pagan worshipers, but at least they lived according to codes of honor and dignity and had some form of justice and righteousness. They didn't have any of it. None. They've been totally bankrupt. Why? Why, why, why? why does so much of the Old Testament has to do with this kind of thing? So much is the display of the sin of God's people. Why? It's because God is highlighting for us that it's not about those outward things you have. Those things don't change you. You must be changed in your heart. The sinful heart takes good things and turns them to evil. And so the problem is never our circumstances. There's a lot of application here. It's not our circumstances that's the issue. It's our hearts that's the issue. It's the way we live through things. It's the way we come at and approach situations. And it's not about what happens to us outwardly. And that's a rut that we can get into. Thinking if only this, if only that, things would be right. But it's not that, man. We're supposed to, you know, take dominion. That's what God calls us to do. We do that through circumstances. Circumstances are not supposed to happen to us. We are supposed to happen to them. We are the act of God as we follow God and trust Him, simply obeying His law and trusting Him, worshiping Him, pursuing Him, seeking good. As we do that, yo, we're forces in His hand. So even all the blessings that they had could not turn them to God apart from His mercy and grace in their hearts. So the picture of Israel is the picture of all people. This is true of all people. And that's where Paul takes it in Romans. That this is not just Israel that does this. This is literally everyone. Israel does it because they're people, just like everybody. 
and people are fallen, and people are sinful. And that's what we do. Okay, thirdly, the executioners and the writer. What's God going to do about this? You know, we know it's bad. Yeah, it's bad. How bad is it? This is how bad it is. God says, therefore, I will act in wrath. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And even though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. He's too through. Oh, snaps. <laughs> He's too through. He's had enough. It maybe it doesn't seem fair. We're just jumping into Ezekiel now, but this is hundreds of years of history. Hundreds and hundreds of years of prophets sent to the people, of opportunities to repent. God is merciful. God is gracious. It's one of the proofs of God's mercy in the Old Testament is how long He took to get to this point where He said, enough's enough. I'm going to pour out my fury on them. It's over. It's done. And this comes in chapter 9 then. So this is where Ezekiel is like, yo, you can't even take it, man. You know? He's getting yelled at by God. It's not, it's not very fun. He yelled in my voice with a loud voice, in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Bring near the executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his weapon for slaughter in his hand. Who are these cats? Again, this is a vision. This is not literally how Jerusalem got destroyed. It literally got destroyed through Nebuchadnezzar, who came back and tore the whole thing down laid siege against it, and the famine was so terrible, and he took it over, and he destroyed the temple. That's how it literally was fulfilled. But Ezekiel sees it in a picture, in an image, in a representation of six destroying men walking through the city. They're, they're grim, you know. You think of the Nazgul maybe a little bit, the angel of, the angel of death, the executioners, with their destroying weapons in their hands. Because it's judgment time. God's mercy is vast. And His compassion is overwhelming. And He gives opportunity to return to Him again and again and again. But beloved, there is a limit to God's mercy. Not a limit in Himself like He runs out of mercy. God never runs out of mercy. He's infinite in everything He is. His mercy is infinite. His compassion is infinite. But in the time that He gives to people, it is very limited. That's what this life is. A space of mercy for people to turn to God. But one day, the clock will run out, the final tick of the clock will strike, and the lights go out, boom, and God's wrath is coming. you got to remember that. Especially us who are young. Life seems like it's going to go on forever. You can't imagine life coming to a close. But the longer you live, the more it accelerates, the more swiftly time goes by, and you realize this life is just going through my fingers like sand. You can't grasp it. It's gone. And we will all stand before God. It's good to remember this. We need this. We need healthy doses of this from Scripture. It's very sobering. To remember that our God is a God of wrath and judgment. And He does not play with sin. It will help us. And it will help us to evangelize others also. Because the time is very short. What is His wrath like? It is fearsome and it is unstoppable. The people in the city here are helpless against these executioners. There's nothing they can do to resist and to protect themselves from God's wrath when it strikes. Uh, Ezekiel has a lot of this. God says this again and again. Here's an example from chapter 5. Thus shall my anger spend itself, and I will vent my fury upon them and satisfy myself. And they shall know that I am the Lord, that I have spoken in my jealousy when I send my fury upon them. Not to be trifled with God's fury. It matters. Sin matters. 
our, oh, he made us in his own image. That's what makes sin so terrible is the dignity that we have as creatures capable of knowing God and reflecting his righteousness and his character and his glory to the world around us. That comes with responsibility. And that's what makes sin so bad and so grievous against him. It's a betraying of trust and faithfulness on every level. That's why he uses that jealousy like of a marriage image there. It's ultimate betrayal. That's what sin is. And it's not sin against the God that we don't know. I mean, we don't know Him savingly. But it's sin against the God we do know. Against our own Creator. The God that everybody knows is real. Sinning against His law that everybody knows. People know what they're doing is wrong. And they know it's against God. So, it's a matter of loyalty and faithfulness and relationship. Sin is aggravated by the personal nature of it. We're persons. God made us that way. We are capable of a personal relationship with God. Well, even in our sin, it is a personal relationship. It's a personal relationship of rebellion and defiance against Him. Yeah, so not very nice. And He tells them, go through the city and strike everyone, every single person, young to old, all of them. But before He does that, <laughs> He sends out this other cat with the white linen and the writing I want a writing case now that must be raw writing case on his waist you know he's got whatever that was and he's supposed to go through the city first because not everyone's going to be destroyed in this there are going to be some who escape the just wrath of God what does he tell them in verse 4 chapter 9 and the Lord said to him pass through the city through Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over the abominations that are committed in it. So before he allows the executioners to move a muscle, first this guy goes out. And he goes to every single person who, what? Grieved over all this idolatry. Now, <laughs> you'd expect him to say, go to every single person who has never committed idolatry. Go mark every person who's clean from idolatry. But that's not, that's not what the mark is. The mark is for those who are grieved about it. Those who hate the idolatry that they see. Those who even understand that in themselves, there's this propensity, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, prone. They, they realize that. So there's this humility amongst these people. Everyone else is having the time of their life. They're thinking, you know, God already forsook the land, so they're thinking, the Lord ain't even here no more, so he didn't even see it. So they're living it up. That's what people will do when they face death. They're just going to live it up and get what they want to get. So it's party time for all the other people. But there's some people in Jerusalem that are not feeling it. They're the righteous because they are grieved and provoked to sorrow by what they see around them. And so he goes around and tells them, he tells the guy, mark them on the forehead. Boom, 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 little marking. You know what I'm saying, Katie? I'm not saying, don't get the tattoo. You know, it's just a vision. It ain't real. But the mark on the forehead. So it's prominent. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't have to... <laughs> There's no papers, please. None of that. You know what I'm saying? It's right there. Boom, in the face. So that when the executioners go through, they know who they're going to pass over. Everyone has got the mark. Makes you think of the Passover. The angel of death passed over all the houses that had the blood. And they were safe as he went out to destroy everyone else in the land. The same thing here. There's the mark of God. What, 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 what's the mark? You know? Um, you know, this comes up. This is Book of Revelation stuff, man. And that's the whole thing, you know. You talk about the mark of the beast, forehead, right hand. But God's servants are also marked in the Book of Revelation. So, you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying like, like it ain't physical. It's not. 
The mark on the head here. Think about it. Why are they marked? They're marked because they're grieved, because their thinking is different than everyone else's. They're viewing everything different. So it's like a mind mark. It's on their heads. These are people who are living life differently. They're seeing things differently. Instead of celebrating the sin and going into it, saying the Lord's forsaken it, we're probably going to die. Let's get as much as we can. No, they're, they're grieved and they're crushed about it. Oh, the head and the hand, you know. The hand would represent the action and the doing. And everyone who's in sin is already marked, beloved. They're already marked in their thinking, already marked in what they do. Yeah, and societies will find ways they have in the past. Rome did, where you had to, to be part of society, you had to prove that. You had to offer the incense to Caesar or to the gods. Just in the same way that God's servants are already marked, or already marked. You know what I'm saying? God already knows those who are his. The Lord knows those who are his. So they're marked and they escape. They're not judged. They're not destroyed. They're not slaughtered. They're left. Now when, um, again, this is a vision, right? But when it actually happened in the land, and the people were taken out, and some righteous folks were taken, like Daniel and Ezekiel, of course. But uh, after Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city, it said he left some of the poorest people of the land to tend the vineyards and the crops and the produce. So those poor people would have been among the righteous, you know, because they would have been also those who were oppressed. So God, there was like a, a remnant that was even left in Jerusalem after the destruction passed through. And for them, I mean, it got, it got ugly pretty quick. So there was, you know, intrigue and there was assassination and there was all that. But like they got to enjoy the blessings of the land even in that. So they were blessed even through and in the destruction of the wicked. And that's, you know, what a picture that is. So, beloved, think about it. You and I, every single one of us, is one or the other, you know? We're either marked with God's mark or we're marked for destruction. And that's it. And we're marked for destruction by birth, by nature. If something radical has not happened to you in your heart, you're still marked. God must change us. He must give us faith in His Son. He must renew us and cause us to be born again so that we may be marked unto God. All right, let's apply. Let's apply. Let's apply some of this, and we'll be through. I could go on forever and ever. Okay, I'm just going to do four applications here. First, application. You ready? God's wrath is for real. It's real, y'all. It's real. And the day is coming when God's wrath will be unleashed upon this world. So when, you, when this world you know, becomes this special jewel that you long for and you long to prosper in the ways of this world, remember that this world and its system is doomed for destruction because our Lord will appear in the sky and come back and destroy this world in His wrath and in His fury. So let's not hold the world up like that. Let's fight against that. I don't mean the physical world. The physical world is beautiful. Jesus is coming back to renew that. He's coming back to reclaim that. He's coming back to raise the physical creation from the dead just like us. He's coming back. It's His world. But the world's system, He's going to destroy. We saw that in Daniel. God's wrath is for real. Don't play with sin. Do not play with sin. It's not worth it. It brings God's wrath. And if you're living a lifestyle of sin then God's wrath hangs over your head. And it's coming. Do not play. Praise God that he's wrathful, though. Praise God. You know, God is not a simp. You can quote that, the millennials. <laughs> God's not the beta type, sit back, ah, whatever, you know what I'm saying? No, God is in control. He's God. So he's not playing about that. So his wrath is also a very good thing, isn't it? that he will express his wrath against those who persecute his people and against those who hurt others and commit injustices, God's wrath will be spent upon them. And that's right, and that's good. And the day is coming when God's people will celebrate that. Okay, second application. Note the priestly nature of sin. Think about this idolatry in their, in their secret room there. They had the incense. 
and the smoke of the incense. They were, it was priestly unto their idols, the priestly nature of sin. All of us are created like this. This is why we have the priesthood of the believers. All of us are priests unto God in this way. Sin, you know, when sin gets a hold of your life, it's like, yo, you do devos. You're doing your daily devos to sin. It's very religious. It's very priestly in nature. It's very worshipful. That's how sin works. That actually teaches us what true worship is like. Worship is not this just outward thing we do. Worship comes from the heart and overflows unto God in expressions of wonder and praise and love unto Him. Just like we do to our idols. That's what worship is. That's what we're about. Unto God, by His grace. But sin comes in and it, it sets itself up and we, we're part of that too. We craft it and put it up and, yo, I'm worshiping this thing, yo. I'm burning the incense unto the idol. So be careful with sin because that's how sin comes in. It grabs our passions. It grabs our you know, infatuations. And it, it grabs our mind and we just can't get off of it. We become obsessed with it. That's how it works. And that's what we're made to do with God, though. So it does also instructive in what true worship's like. Thirdly, sin and holiness both start in the mind. In the mind. Um, this room of pictures, it wasn't a literal place. People in Israel didn't have this in their house, like a secret room that they hid, trap door style, you know, on the bookshelf, take out the book, boom, bat cave, but it's a worship, you know. They didn't have that. This is a picture of what was happening inside their hearts. And that's where sin starts. And isn't it funny? It's always about images and pictures. It's about ideas and figments. You know? That's how Satan tempts us, too. He brings sin and he presents it as this idea that grabs our attention. This thing that seems so beautiful and amazing, so powerful, that we're drawn to worship it. That's how idolatry works. And so it doesn't start in the outward acts of sin. It starts in the mind. Through the lies and deceptions of sin. But we partake in that too in our hearts. Even us who have been changed by God, we're susceptible to this. This is why John, the apostle, ended his letter, first letter, by saying, Beloved, keep yourselves from idols. They're everywhere. And like we said, it can be good things, that we place where God is. And it can be evil things. Right? The evil things are easy. Never, 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 never. If the Bible says it's sin, never. It's never okay. Never. It's easy. I mean, it's not easy, but it's easy to think through. Never. It becomes a lot more difficult when we live in this life and we can worship things, like even good things, like our families, our spouses, our children, our friends, good situations, our jobs. Those are all amazing things, but we have to be kept in check by God's Spirit lest we turn those things into idols. So it really is a, a careful matter. It's touch and go. It really is. You know? But by God's grace, we'll be okay. And, and his, his, the Bible's full of directives for us, teaching us how to, like with the good gifts, treasure the good gift and remember that it comes from God and give thanks to God for it. It's one of the greatest remedies to help us from turning good things into false gods. It's to remember the goodness of God. Once again, but it starts in the mind, so be careful. Be careful. But righteousness also starts in the mind. Just as it did, they were marked on the forehead because they were grieved about sin. You know, God doesn't, God does not require perfection for us to be saved. God's standard is perfection. And that's what we've fallen short of, and that's why we need Jesus. But in order to be saved and a true Christian, God doesn't require us to be perfect. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Praise God for that. It's a life of grace and mercy. And what God is looking for is the trust in Him, faith in Him. That's what pleases God. And with that will come the change in our hearts as we trust in Christ. And with that will come the grief over sin. That's the only standard He gave here for those who escaped, is that they're grieved about it. They didn't have to put a stop to it. They didn't have to ensure that everyone else was worshiping God rightly. They didn't have to be perfect themselves. The requirement was simple. In their minds and hearts, they had to hate it. To hate it. And that's a great mark of being a Christian, is hating sin 
hating it, wishing it wasn't, longing for heaven. That's a mark that we are, that we do belong to God. You know what I'm saying? Unbelievers don't have that. They hate the effects of sin, the punishments of sin, but sin itself they're good with. It starts in the mind. So, yo, it's so important, our thought lives. Fill your head with Scripture, with good teaching, and with truth, beauty, and goodness in all forms. Fill your mind with good fellowship with one another. You know, it's so important that we steward our minds because everything comes from there in the life of the inner self. Fourth application, this is my favorite one. <laughs> Jesus is the one that marks us, that marks his people. He's the one that saves us. It's all him. Now, some, that's what some of the commentators see in the, in, the, in, the, in the man in linen. They see a figure of Christ there going forth to set his lambs apart. That before God's wrath stirs, before the sword is even unsheathed, his people are already marked. He's so careful here. As furious and angry as God is here, he's so careful and he does this first. God will never trample his people in his fury. We are of primary importance to him in Christ. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to be raptured out before the tribulation comes. <laughs> but it does mean that God's wrath will never truly touch us. Even when we do suffer and go through things, it is not God's wrath. You have to remember that. It is not God's fury when we suffer, if we're believers. Why is that? Well, because Jesus was punished for us. Jesus was executed for us on the cross. He drank the fury of the wrath that we deserve. He took it upon himself instead of us, and he's the reason why we can be marked. Now, it's important to remember that. So let's look to Christ today. Let's examine our hearts, y'all. It's good to do that. Examine our hearts for idols things that may be taking hold where they ought not to, things that are getting in the way of our relationship with God. Root that stuff out. We can, through the power of Christ and His Spirit, we can do that. We've been equipped to do that by grace and by the gospel and by His Word. So we can do that. Looking always unto Christ and remembering that the reason why we're safe is because Jesus did actually go through it for us. The punishment, the execution, the fury, the wrath, the judgment, he took all of it out of his great love for us. So let us never, ever forget. Let's pray. Lord, please do what you will with your word today. Stamp it on our hearts. Implant it in our souls. Help us to fear you rightly because you are almighty. And help us to love you accordingly because you are full of steadfast love and compassion and mercy for sinners who turn to you in Christ. So we thank you in his name. Amen.